So let's uh, let's let's talk about your your campaign. Yes. Your you you became a Republican. You said in two thousand nine. Yes. What what about the Republican Party did you feel like was a better fit for you? Um, I think just the whole aspect of personal responsibility. Like that's how I was raised. My father uh, was a disciplinarian, but he also says when you take personal responsibility, he says, "Kim, this is the." greatest country in the world right people are coming here because of the opportunities here yeah um, when you look at and this is one of my things about black lives matter but i won't go off on a tangent when you look at african immigrants that come to this country right they are black right by all appearances there's a lot of them that are very black right and you're telling me black lives matter people are saying you're being pulled over because you're black. You're being stopped because you're black. I have yet to see a hashtag Nigerian name or hashtag name from like Ghana, Cameroon, right? You don't see names like that hashtagged, but they're by all appearances black. So obviously that doesn't. <laughs> did you did you see that that NBA story where they were they 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 were striking over the Jacob Blake thing? Mm-hmm. Yahoo Yahoo Sports included this passage where they said some NBA players have taken to purchasing Teslas because they believe cops won't expect a black man to be driving a Tesla. And it was the most huh. ridiculous thing I heard because <laughs> I'm like, dude, just wanted to buy a Tesla. Right. I don't think the cops are like a Tesla. Uh, oh, I'm, it's probably a white guy driving that car. Right. So he, I'll leave he's that alone. breaking the law. Yeah, I'll leave him alone. Yeah. In the middle of the hood. Tesla. <laughs> Actually, I had, a, I, I had a, uh, an interesting experience when I was like uh I think I was like 19. I met a guy from Haiti. I worked with him at O'Hare Airport. And I didn't know him very well. But he said he didn't like how in the U.S. they try and do all of these politically correct terms for people mm -hmm. like Asian American, African American. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm from Haiti. Yeah. He's like, I'm not an African American. I'm, not, I'm, I'm Haitian. Like, don't call me that. Yeah. It's very, it's very weird how I think a lot of I, I, you know what, man? It's been more and more ever since, especially with Black Lives Matter, that I've started to feel like a lot of the racism we see is actually driven by the Democrats and the progressive left. Absolutely. I, I know it's kind of cliche to say to someone who's a Republican and been a Re Republican for a long time, but here I am being yeah. like, hey, wait a minute. They're the ones saying things like voter ID is racist. Right. But uh, actually, yeah, let, let, let's let's do this. Let me ask your, your, your thoughts on voter ID. What do you think? Um, so this is my my idea. So you're saying because I'm black, I can't get an ID to go vote. <laughs> if if that is what you're saying, that is racist to say. OK, so you're basically saying that black people don't get their driver's license, don't have a state ID, aren't smart enough to do it, aren't smart enough to bring it uh, to go vote. No, for almost for almost everything you need an ID. Right. This is, again, just like we see with the mail-in voting, right? Like I said, all yeah, the ballots. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about, you know, a way they can be fraudulent in the process. It has nothing to do. But they love to use us as like this thing. Oh, wait a minute. Let's think about the blacks. Can they, you, can they rise to the occasion? I don't know. Let's put the brakes on this. But, you know, but it's always, and, and I, I hate to say it, but it's a lot of times it's, it's white officials that are saying, blacks can't handle it you know when do we get the microphone and tell you what we can handle did you see that Ami Horowitz video I did not he went to Berkeley and he asked a bunch of white college students how do they feel about voter ID and they all said it's racist I saw this video I yes did. yes I did and it, it is one of the funniest videos for me uh, again like I, I didn't I didn't grow up in a black area um, I grew up in a relatively mixed poor area but it still kind of resonated to me to see regular people understanding. I'll, t I'll put it this way. I hate elitism. Mm -hmm. And the, this, this progressive racism is like the epitome of ivory tower elites. Mm -hmm. They think they're better. If you look at the data, th these progressives tend to be uh, wealthy, college-educated white people. Yes. And they think they're smarter than everybody. Mm -hmm. And they think they're the saviors of all these poor races. But in reality, that mentality is them thinking they're superior to other races. Mm -hmm. So when I see that video, and my favorite part of it is when uh, Ami Horowitz asks this like middle-aged black dude, you know where the DMV's at? He goes, oh yeah, it's over on 25th Street. As, <laughs> yeah. if, as if he's giving directions. Like, of course he knows where the <laughs> DMV is. Yeah. Do you know yeah. anybody who doesn't have an ID? I don't. But this is, you know, I don't know if a lot of people have seen that video of Candace Owens in front of Congress. Um, and I think Jim Jordan was asking questions and there were three white women 
telling her how oppressed black people are i remember that yes yeah. she had on the blue blazer yeah. and yeah, she's yeah. like that's interesting i've been black my entire life oh. and i am not feeling oppressed today but i'm, I'm so glad these three white women are telling me this isn't <laughs> like, isn't candace kind of like isn't she rich like i'm assuming she's very successful yeah i mean <laughs> i would think so um you know I, I even if she isn't rich she's not oppressed right yeah and, you know, it, it's amazing to me. But again, this is what we see all the time. You know, people actually look at the crowd and some of these Black Lives Matter um, protests or riots. A lot of times it's white people. Yeah. Oh, totally. With the Black Lives Matter shirts on. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, well, where are the black people? You know, I, I heard a story out of I think it was Portland where a woman was like yelling at protesters. Where are the black people at? Because it was a bunch of white people riding and acting a fool. And she was like, what is this? Yeah. Like, what are you people doing? There's, you're, you're not, there, there's actually a bunch of videos like this, though. There's one video where black women stop Antifa from trying to graffiti and start fires. And it's crazy. In one of them, there's like this white woman spray painting. And two black women are like, stop bringing that stuff to our neighborhood. And the white women actually say to the black women, no, no, it's okay. We're helping you. And we're like, we're fighting for you. And it's like, dude, you're destroying their neighborhood. You're not helping right. them at all. Right. It is. It is this. Do you, uh, you, I bring this up a lot. I have to, though. But you, you know about what's going on with repeal Prop 209 in California? Somewhat. It's the Democrats wanting to repeal the civil rights uh, provisions yeah. in the Constitution. How, how is am I just naive or is are the Democrats opposing civil rights and they're pushing racist policies and they think many of them, not all of them, but they think they're su- superior and they're the saviors and all that stuff. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. If you take a good look at, and this is why I think we're always being divided into these little boxes, you know, like your friend was saying, the Asian Americans, the African Americans, even though he was Haitian. It's almost as if we're now pushing segregation, you know? I, I think we definitely are. And it's like, what are we doing? What are we doing? We're rolling back so much of what we fought for. And if civil rights leaders were alive today, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was telling people, don't judge me based on my color of my skin, but the content of my character. That's the opposite of what we're doing today. Have you seen that book from Ibrahim? Uh, I- Ibrahim X. Kendi. Mm-hmm. Is it Abraham or Ibrahim? I-B-R-A-M. Ibrahim? Mm-hmm. Uh, have, you heard of the, have you heard of him? He's got one of the top books in uh, anti-racism. There's a book he wrote called How to Be Anti-Racist. Okay. There's a passage that says... Uh, the only he said something like if discrimination is creating race uh, equity, then it is racist. If it's creating uh, it, or if it's, if it's creating inequity, it's racist. If it's creating equity, it's anti-racist. Therefore, the only solution to past discrimination is present discrimination. And the only solution to present discrimination is future discrimination. Wow. Quite literally saying yeah. we must discriminate based on race. So wow. when I see that that book is a top is a bestseller. And then you look at like white fragility and, and there's many other books in a similar vein. And it's not just white people who write it. It's it's also black people. It's also, you know, it's people of all races. You see Oprah Winfrey picks. I mean, it's like they're they're straight up saying we got to be racist. Yeah. But they, they're trying to change the definition of racist so that they like, I, I guess it, it seems like at certain points these people realized we don't like racism. We want to be just friends and hang out and break bread and, you know, stand by the water cooler talking about what we like. And they realized that if they were going to bring back segregation and discrimination, they had to alter the definition of racism. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they've done. Yeah. Now it means prejudice plus power and you have to have institutional authority or something like that. So now when they write books, quite literally saying that, for one, they are avowed racists. Like you've heard of white fragility. Mm -hmm. The woman straight up says she's uncomfortable. Like if she walked into a room full of black people, that's that's crazy to me. Right. Right. And then she's going to start uh, essentially lecturing everyone else on what on their behavior and people adopt this. So for me, having grown up, uh, I'll put it this way. I grew up pretty lefty when I was younger, mm-hmm. became kind of just like uh, around the Obama time. I was like more of a moderate, still kind of progressive and uh, voted for Obama the first time. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, for me, what, when, when I snapped, it was like literally a month later when he drone bombed a village of women and children. And I was like, Wah! yeah, was like so much for that, I guess. And I tried to be optimistic, like maybe he's got to wind things down because he just came in and no, no, <laughs> no. no. So, so, so for me, that was like, pff, I'm out. But I think there's a lot of people who have always been outside of the Democratic Party and have viewed them as always racist because their history was racist. Yeah. 
And so I don't I don't I don't know what happened in that period after civil rights up until whatever's going on now, but it definitely feels like they're going backwards. They're rewinding the clock toward segregation. We just had that story out of uh, University of Michigan Dearborn where they created a non POC cafe, which was a, a you, you, you stop. Not, ki- not kidding. <laughs> I not wish kidding. They were joking. They apolo- they, they didn't they, they 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 fake apologize for it. Like they have, so basically they did a POC cafe. They're not physical spaces. Okay, first, clarify. Okay. They were like digital uh, digital round tables. And they okay. had one just for, they said non-POC. I think we know what that means. It's the white people. Right. And they said it's facilitated by a white person for, it's facilitated by non-POC with non-POC to talk about their non-POC feelings and community. And then they had the POC one. And I'm just like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Is that where we're so going? So wait, so when did they meet and hear about each other's feelings? I, I don't know if it happened. <laughs> they, they issued an apology for the terminology okay. they used. They said, we're so sorry about the terms we use to describe our it's quote-unquote cafe. It's not even a productive situation. Seriously not. I mean, this is awful. And you know what really kills me? I love when um, liberals get really upset when they say, oh, someone's racist. And then that said person is racist or uh, that they're claiming is racist then says well i'm not racist i have black friends and they're just saying oh that's just a racist thing to say <laughs> i'm like no it's not okay racists don't have black friends right, okay? right, right. <laughs> like they don't they don't and so you know it, it's now it's like just attack everybody and anybody that is not a person of color and tell them basically they are racist and they harbor these inner racist feelings and now they're just now coming out because president trump is now the president yeah what does candace owens said that that makes her a white supremacist in their eyes i don't know not i mean look even even if like now i, I can't i can't even say it she doesn't talk about anything pertaining to white people in that in that regard like she's not talk she talks about responsibility conservatism the black family right i'm like what where where in, where in that is race? Where in that is her supporting whiteness or whatever? Yeah. I guess when you look at the the, the weird definitions, if you if you've seen like there was something, um, it was in the S- Smithsonian. What was it? It was like the the, the um, National Museum of African American History or something. Okay. The, have, have you seen this chart where they explain what whiteness is? I think I did see this. Yes. Man, truly amazing. This is this is really a huge smack in the face for me being like I, I can still I still consider myself to be liberal. I just don't think the Democratic Party represents what I, you know, yeah. what I look for anymore. It says it said hard work is white is, is a white a trait of whiteness. Oh, yeah. Oh, I saw uh, that. Are you yes. nuts? Yes. And then being on time. Wasn't that a thing? Yes. That being thing? On, <laughs> yes. <laughs> being on time. It's like, wow. I mean, it's it's sad. I don't know where we're going. But, you know, this is why I'm glad I'm running for office. And yeah. uh, I hope more people that feel like we're going in a dangerous situation uh, run for office as well. Um, I always consider myself, because I've had a nonprofit for eight years, fiscally conservative, socially liberal. Yeah. How do you... So can you tell me a little bit about your nonprofit, about your um, efforts there? Because that was really Absolutely. interesting to me. Thank you. Um, so I started it... Basically, I was working at a hotel in Georgetown University Hotel and Conference Center. I moved to Baltimore about 10 years ago when I met my husband, right? Now, at that point, fiance. Um, And the commute was a long commute, two hours one way. He's like, just stay home, you know? Um, But, you know, you can only do so many loads of laundry where you're just like, okay, you know, I'm smarter than this. You know, not to say it's a bad thing, but I wasn't even taking care of any kids. I was just sitting there (laughs) at home. So I wanted to start a a nonprofit to help young women that might have had um, traumatic life experiences but were overcoming and doing well. Very good. And so I decided to help these young women with prom. And um, these are girls that basically had good grades, had a plan after high school, whether it was college or going straight to work, you know, um, that couldn't afford prom. And so I would collect prom dresses. Uh, I took all these prom dresses into this high school and the girls are like looking at the dresses and they're like, oh, my God. And I'm like, yes, I got so, so cool. many, right? <laughs> They're like, no, are these from 1982? Where did you <laughs> okay. get these dresses? And I'm like, okay, you've got a point there. You gotta, so yeah. we actually took those dresses. We sold them on eBay. 
And with that money, we actually bought them dresses. And then we were able to spend money on their hair and their makeup. And they had like these whole makeovers. And it was awesome. Um, but when I went to one of the prom send off parties, uh, one of the moms uh, came to me and she was like, you know, I wish I could offer you something to eat. You know, she's like, you can come and sit down in their living room. There was uh, like lawn chairs for their furniture. And, you know, I know this young woman would tell me all the time how their electricity was on and off. And she was sometimes doing her homework by candlelight. Yes. And so I'm talking to the mom and she was like, I would love to go back to work. I just don't know how to do it. And then a light bulb comes on. Oh, yeah. right? And you're like, oh, wait a minute, Kim. If you get parents, you know, back to work, of course, they can afford prom and everything else. So I I totally switched gears after the first year um, and I started helping women coming out of incarceration, rehabilitation and homelessness um, through nonprofits that already existed. Their employment specialists would call us and say, hey, can you get her ready for a job interview by Tuesday? Um, and so we were still collecting these donated clothing and then just set up selling them on eBay and we would give them entire makeovers. Wow. That's so neat. Yeah, so we helped. Wow, a lot this episode. <laughs> yeah. Over 200 women become gainfully employed. 30% went on to be financially independent. But that's, to me, the only way you're going to lift anyone out of poverty is with employment. And so I think people need to understand that, you know. And, um, you know, that's why that's, you know, a major part of my platform is people becoming independent. So yes. to me, that's like, that's really unusual because it's so consistent between what you say about wanting people to take personal responsibility and your, you know, your nonprofit and mm -hmm. getting these girls to take responsibility and rewarding them for doing so and then doing the same with women who wanted to go back to work. I think that's a wonderful thread to carry through. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, and it's so simple, right? So we didn't get any funding. We didn't get any grant money. We didn't get anything. Yeah. Um, we were just like, all right, how do we make money? eBay, you know, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, and it's just literally just taking a regular idea and saying, all right, this is how we got to, you know, tackle the issue. But this is what's crazy about it. Like, I'm a college dropout myself. I didn't finish. It wasn't for me. I dropped out. But here we have these politicians that with all these degrees and they supposedly know all this stuff. Right. And they could come up with these innovative ideas. Yet no one seems to be able to tackle the situation that we see in the inner cities and it's like, well, are you really the smart guy? I think you're smart enough to do it. You just don't want to do it. And that's where I have the issue. Dependency. Yeah. If you had a bunch of free thinking, independent people, they wouldn't want to vote for you and they want guaranteed votes. Mm -hmm. If you were stuck on benefits and I've, I've, I know people who have gone through this where it's very difficult to get off the cycle. Yes. Then you're going to keep voting for the person who says, don't worry, I'll keep it coming. Right. That's a bummer. It is a bummer. And this is why, you know, I, I really started doing some research. And um, I don't know if people are familiar with Jerron Smith. He works with the Trump administration. He helped with prison reform and the First Step Act. And, you know, everyone says, oh, he's that one black guy that works at the White House in the West Wing. <laughs> and it's like, oh my gosh. he's not the only black guy. He's just like the one with the, the biggest position over there. But, you know, he talks about how, you know, you've got Section 8, right? Section 8 housing vouchers. Um, with those vouchers, um, it came with basically having the man leave the home so the women could get them. And that's still how it is today. That's awful. But then, you know, he said, I started thinking like, uh, you know, if you've got Section 8, is there a Section 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7? And so he looked it up and, you know, we're looking at it. Section 3 says the same thing as Section 8. But the dad can stay in the home. What? Wow. That's crazy. So why on earth? And this is one of those things I talked about with Richard Fowler. If you could change the policies, right, to make things a little bit better in the black community, like Joe Biden supposedly wants to do 50 years later, why not replace Section 8 with Section 3? If, if that's where you want people to be dependent. And then to me, that brings in what? Two incomes in the household. You know, then you're weaning people off of it. The father's still in the home. You've got the family structure piece. Why did we go with Section 8 over Section 3? Do you see the Black Lives Matter mission statement? Uh, how they want to dismantle the family? Disrupt the nuclear family structure or something to that effect. Yeah. Why yeah. would they want to do that? We, we've, we know, we, we, we've looked at a bunch of studies. And right now, some of the data I've read says they don't, they don't know necessarily if it's a father and a mother or just two parents in general. It might just be as simple as two parents because you have double income and you have someone to be with the kid and, and you know. Mm -hmm. But regardless, the data shows that uh, two parents, a traditional family structure or however, as long as it ends up with the parents, you know, being able to raise their kid, 
they they prosper. Right. And in single parent households, they they struggle. Right. Or they're more likely to, I should say, not 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 a guarantee. Right. Why would you actively try to encourage that? Right. The only thing I can think of is there aren't actually black people writing the mission statement for Black Lives Matter. That's I wouldn't be surprised. The, that's the only thing I can think of. Because if you are black, you know, what is it, about 70% uh, black children are living in a single mother household. We know which friends uh, became successful and which ones didn't. And we know what their childhood was like. Um, you know, that's not news to us. They do have that data down, right? But we know that just based on how we grew up and who we grew up around. So it makes no sense. So let me, uh, let's go, let's go to some policy stuff. You've got yes. policies on your site. What do you want to do? What's your, what's your, first yeah. of all, what's your pipe dream? What's your pie in the sky? If you, if you get, when you get elected, yes, you've got some things you want to do. Absolutely. So uh, first and foremost, like I said, I talk about employment, right? But not just jobs, right? We're always talking about raising the minimum wage. What about careers, right? Some real good salaries with benefits. Um, as we saw with the lockdown, we relied on other countries for PPE. Why not bring that billion dollar medical equipment industry right back to America, right? That would bring back this, these, you know, we were a manufacturing powerhouse at one point in Baltimore. We have the second largest, busiest port at one point uh, right there in Baltimore City, right? Our, our port is the same size as a port in Connecticut where they've got the submarines, you know, they've got the, the windmills, all the jobs, right? They've got so much going on there. We have the same exact size and we've got, what, two cruise ships coming in a week, <laughs> going back out. We're not utilizing at all. Um, so this is what I talk about a lot. This is what I talk about with Duran uh, over at the White House. And this is why President Trump tweeted, you know, Kimberly Klasick will bring it back and, and bring it back fast because he knows that we've been having these conversations. Um, opportunity zones, a big deal. Uh, the Trump administration in the past four years has taken $75 billion and invested in opportunity zones in these Democrat cities that have been just left neglected. Um, what's interesting about it is when you look at the opportunity zone map in Baltimore City, you will see that the neighborhoods that I was walking in in my videos, Sandtown, Easterwood, Carrollton Ridge, um, those areas were left out of the map. And what's interesting about it is my opponent writes this op-ed saying it was President Trump, but he did not, he didn't do the Opportunity Zone map. That was left up to local leaders, right? But, but people believe that because they don't do their research and see, you know, who wrote this map. And so anyway, so I actually took some community leaders in January down to the White House to meet with Duran and talk about what they can do. And I posted that picture not too long ago. Um, you know, we had something uh, back in the day, I think it was called Empowerment Zones, uh, which is similar and i actually got a lot of crap from uh, some republicans on twitter because i said you know we had something similar it didn't really work because we gave local leaders way too much power and control mm -hmm. i said if we do opportunity zones right in baltimore city we're gonna have to do a carve out because our local officials are way too corrupt and we're going to be in the same situation just because i said i like trump's opportunity zones but i'm gonna request a carve out i got a phone call from black voices from Trump and they said how dare you say that <laughs> and I was like dude what no L look at Baltimore look at our history Bill Clinton did the same thing with empowerment zones it didn't work local officials got involved right so anyways they weren't happy about that but I did go down and I talked to Duran about it you know we were looking at it and he goes you know what you're right you're right there needs to be a carve out or we need to change the structure here so that's my big push. Uh, as we know, there is a trucker shortage across this country. Um, I know, you know, eventually, it, you know, technology will probably give us what trucks that drive themselves, the drones yep. that are dropping off boxes. Totally. Uh, but we're not at that point yet. And we have a lot of people in the area um, that could benefit from going to that CDL six week program. Uh, to get their license. That'd be great, yeah. yeah. And we, you know, the six weeks, $2,000 per person. We are supposedly getting $1.1 $1 .1 billion a year. I don't know where it is. <laughs> Someone's but, pockets are lined with gold. Exactly. But, you know, when I talk to people in the area, they say, you know, that would be great. We would love to do something like that. And, it, and that's an easy class. There's uh, nonprofits, Maryland New Directions. There's all these people that actually do the behind the wheel training, all states involved in it. Six weeks six weeks we can get someone you know these trucker positions um you know we've got amazon right there in baltimore too 
Um, and, uh, you know, I would hope that we would offer them more warehouse spaces that we could actually do this. Even even if we get these self-driving trucks, mm -hmm. we need local drivers because yeah. the self-driving trucks stop outside the cities and then you need a driver to bring them in. Right. So that'd be that would be, that could yeah. be huge. That's yeah. A, yeah. Good point there, Tim. Um, and then, uh, of course, education. Uh, I'm talking about school choice. So this is uh, the easiest way uh, to I've been able to explain it where people are able to digest it. Um, I say, look, you know, your schools are not that great in this area, right? Sometimes schools need a little competition, right? We do have some charter schools and they do great. Um, but I say, just think, if you say, you know, your kid has always wanted to run track and you think they'd be really good at it. Just think if you could send your child to a school with an actual track team. Just think if you could send your child to a school with a golf team or a swim team and you know that they would excel at this. And they're like, yes. I want that opportunity for my child. I mean, look at look at the way the college system is set up with minority scholarships. You know, my stepson, he wanted to play golf. Um, you know, like, yes, go play. Right. <laughs> you know, here is a, a, a black American wanting to play golf and he was good. You know, go get those offers. Go get the scholarships. Those opportunities exist. They're already there. Um, so there's things that you can do. And, and that's how I, I really explain um, school choice. I mean, we got to do some education system anyways. Um, Baltimore City uh, CEO, the public school CEO, Sonia Sanchez makes $350,000 a year. And we've wow. got so many but kids. Why? Exactly. Oh my gosh. Exactly. A lot of money. You know, the administrators make a ton of money. Yet the kids still graduate. I'm able to read, write, or do basic math. Man. So that's a problem. Thanks for checking out this clip from the Timcast IRL podcast. We do the show live. Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. So come back to check us out when we go live. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, hit the notification bell. And we are also available on all podcast platforms for free. If you want to listen to us there, thanks for hanging out and we will see you all next time.